Okay, so actually this uh, talk actually uh, was uh, initiated originally by uh, Adam suggesting we were discussing at RoboCup about various things and uh, got a little bit into this issue of software frameworks and uh, ROS and all these kind of things. He told me about these summer schools and the Connect Community Ray. So, um, okay, let's see uh, what I have to say. Uh, I would like to start with presenting a little bit very briefly uh, a few things that uh, we are actually doing and I will also talk uh, quite a bit about architecture which is very uh, relevant I uh, think for this uh, topic and uh, this is of course joint work I'm presenting here mainly done in this European research project uh, race. And I apologize to some of the people who uh, have been in one of the BRICS <laughs> research camps who might have seen some of the slides uh, already. So, okay, this is our uh, RoboCup lab. Um, as you can see, it has a green floor. So we used to play soccer formerly, and now we turned it into uh, a lab where this half uh, side is actually tables where students work, and the other side is a fully equipped uh, apartment with a, a lounge area and racks. We have a fully equipped and functional kitchen. We have a, a dining table, a living room, and uh, all this kind of stuff. So what kind of things would we like our service robots to do there? First of all, safely navigate in the environments. We have rooms with furniture, so mobility is an issue. We have task-relevant objects that we want the uh, robot to manipulate. So object manipulation is an issue. And um, what is important for these tasks is uh, that uh, I'm also interested in uh, spatial representations and uh, reasoning. So the spatial knowledge does not only concern what is typical for navigation, like rooms, but also doors, moving objects, moving people, and all these kind of things. So this is what we work. These are the robots that uh, we have uh, in the consortium, at least. We don't have one. This is in Leuven, our, one of our partners. Um, this is a robot we used until, until a couple of years ago for our at home team and uh, which actually became world champion 2009 in Graz and uh, this is a robot uh, more or less at least uh, that we use right now. There are more robots in the consortium you know like uh, Neobotics or Bluebotics is also involved in so there are many different platforms. And one of the, uh, the BRICS project actually arose from, uh, the, from a former project where the outcome of this project was this robot, a two-armed robot about uh, five years ago now. And um, uh, well, there was actually the creme de la creme in German robotics was involved in that uh, 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 project. They happened to be only an evaluator and a reviewer. But it turned out that uh, architecture and software development was a major problem for this uh, project, even at the end. So this is a slide I am communicating for more than 10 years now. Yeah, if we talk about software development and robotics, it is a very hard issue. And the question is, where does this complexity and the, uh, the hardness of the problem come from? And I usually classify this in three dimensions. One is we have a very heterogeneous hardware. No two robots I think I saw on any slide presented here this whole week seem to say uh, to have the same hardware. And uh, there are a lot of variety of sensors, lots of different actuators and so on. And that uh, makes things already complex. There's a lot of device dependent code uh, because of that. Another one is that we usually have to deal with distributed real-time computing for any non-trivial robot system. So you have to use available constraint resources optimally, deal with concurrency and communication issues, and so on, and still remain responsive to uh, input signals. And the third one is software heterogeneity. As we have seen, uh, for many complex robot applications, it's important to integrate a huge variety of different computational and algorithmic approaches from uh, AI-based task planning to navigation and all these kind of things, perception, computer vision, uh, signal processing, speech recognition, all these kind of things are relevant. And it's by far not clear to come from. This view is actually not exclusively by me. Uh, Felix Ingroff from Lars in um, 
friends actually presented uh, at our last research camp uh, a slide he allowed me to use as well where you find basically uh, similar things. So the complexity comes also from the heterogeneity. Yeah. So what makes the problem really hard? We already said hardware dependency, we have missing abstractions that might sound strange to those of you who are maybe have more engineering background, but abstractions is what computer science is all about. Yeah? So everything we, uh, if you look at, uh, for example, programming language development and stuff like that, it is all about abstractions at the very end. Uh, database systems, whatever you name it, it is finding the right abstractions and making these available as tools to the uh, engineers to uh, build good systems. There are very few widely accepted common methods um, for many of the functional tasks we have to solve. There are no widely accepted architectures, no reusable components, almost at least. Yeah. So what do I mean if I talk about a robot architecture? Yeah. In my understanding, for example, something like this could be a robot architecture. This picture actually I presented at uh, at a um, scientific event organized by the Desire Project, the one who built this uh, two-arm robot, at the very beginning of that project where they were looking into uh, various uh, software frameworks uh, and uh, what they could uh, ease them to build. And you can see they had, in this case, foreseen four computers networked by a local area network. There are lots of different functionalities uh, there. You have all kinds of interfaces at that time even. Uh, so there's FireWire, there's analog camera interfaces, there's um, various USB, uh, then we have CAN buses and so on. And then you have uh, interesting uh, constraints like, uh, I don't know whether, no, it's not there. Uh, for example, this arm, the interface, yeah, it puts a very, very hard constraint on and if you don't give it a set point precisely every one millisecond and you miss one frame, the inter control interface would simply stop. So the engineers would have to go there and do some really hard reset procedures to get it working again. So if you miss one frame, that's it, yeah, then uh, the whole uh, show is over. So the, in the context of the project, various workshops were actually held and uh, I gave a presentation there which was later used by other people also for a title of their um, publication, which I titled 1001 Architectures for 1001 Robots. That to indicate that every robot description, every paper I have uh, seen and read so far seemed to present a different robot architecture. And there are of course, uh, the question is, why is nobody using someone else's robot architecture? Uh, and I think there are reasons that are beyond our control, yeah, where we cannot do much about, except for making us aware of them. So for example, the not invented here syndrome is a, a very hard problem. Yeah? People always think they can do it better, uh, yeah, that something is wrong with what they could see and use for, uh, that has been built by others. Uh, so, um, it is a generic excuse that you actually can do whatever you want yeah, without looking at what others had already done. Uh, there are limited horizons, yeah, sometimes prejudices like whatever. Uh, Americans never even bother to read European papers or so, or this country cannot write structured code or all these kind of things. They, they are around, they are not so uh, clearly voiced maybe. Yeah. So there are lots of them and of course they exist everywhere just generically replace Americans with Italians, Germans, Japanese, whatever you want. Yeah. So by the way, uh, this is an interesting one. Nobody is using this, everybody is using ROS. Yeah. That's a prejudice right now. I hear very frequently since quite some time. But five years ago, ROS was MS Robotics Studio. Yeah. And eight years ago, this was Player Stage Gazebo. So that everyone is uh, actually crowdsourcing now on ROS does not at all mean that ROS is the end of the story and for the rest of your life you will have to deal with ROS and that's the answer to all these problems. Yeah? More likely it is not. Okay, there are uh, some reasons for not using another uh, architecture that are maybe within our control or where we could do something in science to do that. So 
not knowing about it is a reason. I cannot get sufficient information to determine whether it's useful or not. Yeah? I cannot access the system or the source code. Uh, I cannot build the system on my machine. And that's actually something that happened to me when I start, uh, wanted to try to start play a stage. The first 10 attempts ended basically with the download and trying to, to do the build process and it never worked. It never worked. Yeah? So all these reasons, that's something we can do something about. It. Yeah? Okay, so um, it's so quiet, so I guess you are focused, so it's time a little bit uh, to lighten you up. So um, in the research camp, we had actually a discussion the day before I gave a talk about whether you should comment source code or not. Yeah? In the HL community, the recommendation since 10 years now is not to put source code comments. Yeah? So although each of us almost has been indoctrinated by you have to document your code, put comments in your code. Yeah? No, uh, if you have to put a comment in your code, it means that you probably have made a mistake somewhere else. So you should rather use speaking names, good function names, good method names, good variable names, and all these kind of stuff. And if there's still occasionally a need to put in some comment, okay, uh, I can live with that. But uh, the agile community uh, uh, evangelists would, would not accept that. Yeah? And so this is also a comment, a toilet brush has been provided for your use, please use it if needed. And someone put a sign on it, I don't know whether you can see it's an extra paper. My advice to everyone is don't do it, it hurts too much, stick to toilet roll. Okay. So let us ask us for a moment, what actually is a robot architecture? Yeah? Once we started thinking about this, we found out that um, frequently when I talk to someone, this person seems to have a completely different understanding of what I'm talking about. Yeah? So this is an example definition I found uh, a couple of uh, months ago. A robot architecture is a combination disposition of the different kind of joints that configure the robot kinematical chain. That was not what I had in mind when talking about a robot architecture. So, yeah, what they mean is, for example, classical architectures, and they talk about Cartesian, cylindrical, polar, angular, and so on. And these are examples. The SCARA robot architecture, that's an architecture for them. Yeah. Um, where does this actually come from? It's a tutorial that has been uh, published by Josep uh, and Alicia Casals at, in Barcelona. So two well-known uh, figures in the robotics community, at least in Europe. And uh, it's not that someone who might not have the right training uh, or did not know the terminology was using it. But it's uh, maybe a different community, a different background. The closest I could find in these 72 slides on the robot architecture was actually this. Yeah, similar architectures, quote unquote, I often found, find in, in scientific papers that I have to review. And they don't really tell you much. Yeah? So all the magic things are going on here in the, in the programming. Programming actually is something that happens to me offline. So this would not there at runtime. So the external sensors could not even connect to something that is going on the runtime. So it kind of feels itchy to me yeah, if I see a picture like that. So my advice is if you want to publish papers and you don't have a better architecture than that, then better don't include the picture yeah, in the first place. Because this will kill it, your paper. So, what is definition of a software architecture on wikipedia.org? Yeah? So, it's a system of, uh, the software architecture of a system is a set of structures needed to reason about the system, which comprise software elements, relations among them, and properties of both. Yeah? Also refers to documentation of a system software architecture. Yeah? And so on. So, that's enough for us. That's basically the idea. So, um, to make a long story short, um, this describes our current view when we talk about architecture, we talk about different aspects of architecture. So, for example, a lot of the engineers, when they talk about architecture, like the, this other slide said, they talk about hardware architecture. So, for example, a mechanical structure, 
Yeah? You can talk about the electrical wiring of this thing. And you can have a computational architecture if you tell me which microcontroller boards and computers and embedded controllers and stuff like that you have put onto the system and how all these are connected. Yeah? So if I talk about the computational architecture is the only one that is really interesting to me as a software uh, guy. Yeah? Because there I want to know what are the computational devices that I can program because this is what I am developing against. Yeah? Whatever I develop eventually has to be running on this computational architecture. So on the software side, I think we should distinguish at least three different levels. Yeah? So one is a functional architecture. That is what is often put into, or people intend to put into papers and what makes a lot of sense. So you define boxes like computer vision or uh, maybe on a more detailed level, uh, image pre-processing, feature detection, whatever, object classification, things like that. These are functional elements. Now the functionality does not say anything about how this is implemented where it is running and stuff like that. Right? You just want to describe, okay, here's some kind of input and we want to compute some kind of algorithms on that and so on. And uh, maybe not even the algorithm is determined that this is functional architecture. The component architecture is what we call uh, in, in our group, <coughs> these are all the things that are related to software. Right? So here, it does not make any sense to talk about classes or ROS nodes or stuff like that. Yeah? Functionality should have nothing to do with the implementation that uh, you are going to do about it. Here, you talk about this. And the connecting link is actually the runtime architecture because uh, what we should do is that we develop a software and if we modify the hardware underneath it, we wouldn't want to go back to square one and start all over from scratch. Yeah? So we should develop the software such that it is very easy to change the underlying um, hardware on which it will eventually be running. Yeah? And the runtime architecture is ex exactly doing the job, so it is mapping a particular software architecture. So mapping, for example, processes and threads on actual computational devices uh, running it. Okay, so these two slides just explain a little bit in more detail what I've already talked to you about, so I'll skip them. And um, yeah, this is um, maybe a slide I should uh, skip as well, but in our project, the term of best practice, BRICS stands actually for best practice in robotics. And um, that notion was not an invention and not certainly not my desire to name the project like that, but some coordinators had this wish. Yeah? But since three years we are discussing what is best practice and how do you determine it. So I made an effort to look up a definition and found this. Yeah? And there you could say, for example, best practice in robot architectures is something that no one can determine right now. Because this definition uh, assumes that something, for example, a particular architecture is used or applied frequently, at least more than once. Yeah? And only if it repeatedly proves to be useful, then you can say something like this is best practice. As long as this is not the case, yeah, you are just making claims like everyone else. Yeah? Okay, so another uh, goal that we have in uh, in BRICS is actually, um, we would like to foster reuse, another central core thing. And what I mean by that is assume that we have uh, this small KUKA robot with the arm, many of you have seen already. And this is an example architecture when we started to develop something for the <coughs> RoboCop at work uh, competition. I, I drew myself through this architecture. Yeah? As always, the students never implemented it. But it's something completely different. But imagine we have some architecture here, and now the task is to transfer this uh, fetch and carry task from this robot to this robot. Yeah? So which parts of the architecture, which parts of the software should we be able to reuse, and which parts are 
uh, hardware specific, for example. Yeah? Obviously, this is a completely different machine than this one. But there are certainly elements there that should be the same. And uh, I see no reason why they should not work both for this and for this robot. Yeah? <coughs> OK, so these are some of the issues. I now get uh, to the actual uh, uh, topic of the talk, uh, which is the software development process. So every one of you knows this picture. Yeah, you have seen that before. Uh, indicating, yeah, what is it actually indicating? It indicates that software development is a complex process and that communication is a major problem. Yeah? So that's one of the things why we, or one of the reasons why we have uh, things like software development processes. These are not to make your life hard. Yeah? Software development processes are there because they try to install some kind of reasonable organization of the work and of the communication of the people involved in the process. Yeah? <clears throat> and how it can go wrong is illustrated here. So what kind of organization of the process to choose? Well, again, you can look at the organization of some successful companies yeah, and try to do that. By the way, this is legal department here at Oracle, for example. Uh, I also like the guns at Microsoft. I didn't know about this management method. And interesting, I found that. OK. So um, this is actually what we propose. And uh, I should say right from the beginning, uh, there is no scientific proof that this process makes sense. I uh, wouldn't know that any of the software development processes is a little bit like a economic theory. Usually people <coughs> propose a particular process and then people try to apply it. <coughs> Sometimes initially not very successful, but uh, over time um, it is supported by the right tools and uh, there's experience gained on actually doing that and then they become successful processes. Yeah. There's no way to, for example, prove that it's a workable thing beforehand other than uh, you know, scrutiny and, and rational, uh, uh, rational view on that. So we have eight phases defined, and I claim that several of these phases are notoriously neglected in the robotics community by all the development groups that, <coughs> that you have, or at least most of them. Yeah? So for example, I claim that most of the students are actually in this phase. Yeah? PhD people work in this phase only, almost. Yeah? Sometimes they do a little bit of platform building, sometimes they do a little bit of system deployment, but basically they are here. Even a lot of companies are not, avail uh, are not aware of the remainder. And I think good development process starts with scenario building. Yeah? So define the environment and what the robot is supposed to do. I'm surprised how often and how frequently I see projects where this is not clear and not reasonably well described. Yeah? You sometimes cannot fully describe that, but <clears throat> if I ask them, okay, in which environment is your robot supposed to work, then people are doing this. Yeah? And, uh, and it, it's not clear, they might say indoor, outdoor, but what kind of features can appear indoor? Are there stairs? Are there steps? Is this carpet? What kind of surfaces? Are people in there? What kind of people? What are, can you say about lighting conditions and all these kind of things that have a heavy influence on a, the performance of, of a lot of the functional units that they are uh, building. So then functional design specify the functional architecture. I think this can be done if you have a good understanding of what the robot is uh, supposed to do. Then you can more or less in parallel build platforms and capabilities yeah, you eventually have to deploy the system to make it really run on the hardware. Uh, then a phase system benchmarking, product deployment, and finally uh, product maintenance. And I'm going to explain these in a little bit more detail. Yeah. But by the way, these are the steps that are 
roughly underneath each of these. Yeah? So this is an intimidating figure, but um, we'll get uh, to it. <coughs> and um, as we are also talking about software architectures, not functional architecture, this is our view I will structurally uh, or stepwise uh, define what is actually going on on these different levels. Uh, but that's our view of how the software architecture should be structured. Okay, sorry, there's an animation in it that I skip. Okay, so what are the activities you should do in scenario building? The first is define the scenario, for example, with your target uh, user group yeah, or your customer. And a good way to do this is to use uh, storybooks. <coughs> yeah? So imagine you have to, um, to create a film, maybe an animated film about uh, this potential robot application. Yeah? And everything you need to actually draw such or, or make such a film, either in animation or in reality, uh, should go there. Yeah? Then there's an important step that has raised eyebrows a lot. And this time, generalize the scenarios. Because if you talk to customers, they have one particular scenario in mind. But what they usually want is that they automatically imply, if you are able to recognize and handle this cut, that you are also able to handle, for example, uh, I don't have an example here right now, these other cups. Yeah? Or the plastic cups that we have upstairs for, for water, and so on. So, I just want you to think systematically about your scenario is where are the variability points and how much variability do you want to allow. Yeah? Because only if you do this you can expect later on that someone develops a system that is likely to perform in all these variations with some reasonable uh, uh, chance for success. Yeah? If you leave out such things uh, already from the very beginning, then this might already be a, a failure. At this point, you should also build a simulation model for these scenarios. Simulation model without the robot model. Yeah? But all the, the things, how the environment looks like, I think, in fact, that if you would have a good tool for building, uh, uh, a good interactive tool for building a simulation model, you could use this <laughs> even in the uh, scenario definition process very well. Yeah? And then define customer acceptance tests. Yeah? That's another phenomenon I, I'm uh, observing, that uh, you agree with a student that in half a year he should have something implemented and the robot is supposed to do something. Yeah? <clears throat> but uh, if you do not define reasonably well, a test that says, okay, I want to see that the robot is exactly doing this and that, then they will inevitably, because they will run into problems of all kind, yeah, they will modify the environment the system was intended uh, to run. Yeah? So, therefore, you, if you come to robot labs, you see a lot of uh, glasses that are covered with paper. And for good reason. Yeah? Because these classes uh, are a problem for laser scanners. Yeah? So the simplest thing is to simply put a few A4 sheets and uh, tape, and that solves the problem for them, instead of tackling it in the robot. Yeah? And there are many such things. The objects being manipulated become simpler and so on, and the, the scenario becomes simpler instead of two objects being allowed to stand next to each other, they are all separated, and so on and so on. And at the end, we end up then solving all the simple problems over and over again without tickling the hard ones. So in our software architecture thing, you kind of specify what the robot application layer is actually doing, and the people involved are the customer and the application developer. Yeah? <coughs> so, this is another thing that is often uh, overlooked when specifying scenarios. Yeah? So, some real requirements are, for example, guarantees of safety properties. Now, that is very important. None of the PhDs that I know is usually concerned with these kind of things. And rightly so, because no one has told them that it's a, a major issue. Yeah? 
So they worry about, they want to improve whatever object recognition or mobile manipulation or some kind of, uh, of uh, trajectory planning and all these kind of things. Uh, but safety concerns, uh, they only recently become uh, more of interest. And how important they are, this is an interesting <laughs> thing I found on the web. It says the beer costs 70 cents, uh, the uh, electric barbecue 57, but the courage on the, that these guys have is, uh, you know, cannot be paid for. Uh, so you see the wire, the two shoes here. You can only hope that the other end of the cable is not plugged in. So they're sitting in the pool and they, they have the extension cord floating on the water. So. In the name of science. Huh? In the name of science. Yeah, of course. So don't do that. Yeah, okay. And this is the thing that you should not do. Also, this is quite uh, tricky. Okay, functional design. Uh, would be the, the next step. Um, so once you have uh, some understanding of the scenario, you can derive hardware requirements for them. Yeah? So for example, if you need to read door signs, you probably cannot do that without some kind of camera. Yeah? If you need to navigate or uh, determine distances to objects and stuff like that, you probably need some kind of distance uh, measurement device. Yeah? So you can uh, derive both hardware requirements and top-level functionalities. Uh, you can uh, also decompose the top-level functionalities usually. So we do have some experience or knowledge about how to perceive the environment and things like that. And you can validate the functional design using the scenario. Yeah? So if in this process you kind of mind simulate, does my architecture, my functional architecture actually work? Yeah, what is it if I go through the storybooks, are there any elements where I have not yet foreseen the required functionality? Yeah? And so on. So this basically means that you are specifying here top down yeah, what kind of components you're going to need to uh, supply the required functionalities down at least to what we call the component layer. Yeah? <coughs> so, Phase three platform building, you will have to uh, build the actual hardware platform, uh, build the software platform, or what we call the software platform. So this is all the device drivers you need for that, the operating systems, uh, all the, uh, the utilities, whatever you would consider a operating system uh, level functionality. Yeah? And uh, in this phase, you should also build an emulation model. I used intentionally the word emulation instead of simulation because I think this is what we should target for. Yeah? If you look at hardware developers, they have emulators for chips. Yeah? So they even can build the motherboard yeah, with the socket for the, for the chip yeah? and then you plug in a, a hardware interface where a software simulator or emulator sits at the other end and emulates, for example, this chip. Yeah, so they can develop whole computers, notebooks, and applications without actually having a chip on hand already. And this is where we should also get in robotics. Yeah? So um, I think the time where simulation has been uh, done away with as not being an appropriate tool in uh, robotics uh, really has to end. Uh, if car manufacturers can build uh, cars for which you pay a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars per piece, and they can do it making extensive use of simulation models. And I don't see a reason why this should not be possible in robotics. Yeah. And you should de uh, develop devices here, or uh, not devices, sorry, uh, um, capabilities here for system component testing. Yeah. So most of you have been at competitions and like RoboCup, the first thing you want to do when your robot arrives at the site, you move it out of the box, screw everything together, what you think uh, or is necessary to be screwed together, and then you want to run a suit of tests which give you or confirm you that every single hardware component is correctly working. And you don't want to just run your whole application and only discover later on, oh, there's a problem somewhere. Yeah? It cannot detect 
this person anymore and then you have no idea what uh, this is coming from. So at least you know, okay, the hardware seems to be okay. If a problem now occurs, it should be somewhere in the software layers. Yeah. So <clears throat> that basically means in our picture, we are having components here, yeah, which get actually uh, instantiated with particular hardware devices. They come with uh, custom specific or uh, yeah, with uh, customized or vendor specific uh, device interfaces, which we uh, wrap with the object oriented layer and turn into components. Yeah? So this is <coughs> the approach that uh, would be uh, necessary. <coughs> I don't know why I included this, probably to ease you up again a little bit, but I found a very easy uh, repair instruction for anything, yeah? also an example for good abstraction. Yeah? And the central question, does it move? If it, uh, it, if it moves, then you ask, should it move? If it does, it's okay. If it does not, use tape. Otherwise, if it's not supposed to move, and but it should, then there's this WD-40. You have this in the US as well, right? I think this is available worldwide. Yeah? And if it doesn't move and it shouldn't move, then it's all right. So very generic. OK, capability building. That's what you, most of you guys are doing most of your time. Yeah? So you usually have a particular functionality where you want to build software for which gives you this functionality. Yeah? And uh, I don't want to go too much into details about this because, first of all, most of you know this much better than I do because you do it on a daily basis. <coughs> But, uh, for example, I put in here a step that is often underestimated and it should be there, at least in larger project, which is content generation. So, <coughs> Claude has uh, presented uh, various techniques for using machine learning to do that. Yeah? Many of these machine, or most of these machine learning techniques need data, training data for this. Yeah? And uh, where do you get this data from? This can be a substantial <coughs> effort to just generate these data, especially if they need to be labeled and stuff like that. Yeah? <coughs> and I think uh, time would also be right to uh, that the community is actually generating huge databases yeah, that can be used for training such things. Yeah? I know that there are some reference databases for certain image. Uh, processing problems and, and other machine learning problems, but I'm not so sure whether these would really be uh, well uh, designed, for example, to give a manufacturer who wants to uh, build a service robot for households uh, the necessary uh, data to train um, a facility or a robot to recognize all kinds of kitchenware and stuff like that. Yeah. Again, these things for every skill you build, you should define a test to test it. Yeah. Okay, so that means basically, um, this is now here, we saw the hardware side here, the software side, we might, uh, for example, take legacy uh, algorithms that provide us with certain functionality, wrap them in an object-oriented uh, manner, then we make components out of them and use them to build the capabilities that uh, we have. That is basically the idea. And uh, what we want to do here is actually component-based uh, composition. Um, most of the work it brings is actually focused around uh, uh, this idea, but there would be another 90-minute talks uh, to uh, discuss it. <coughs> One thing maybe that uh, is a good hint, there's an interesting paper uh, in 1996 by Radestock and Eisenbach coordination in evolving systems, and they introduce a separation of concerns issue, which we have taken up and extended a little bit. So I think they have four concerns, we have five concerns. So for every component, uh, for every component that we develop, we try to separate as far as possible the actual computation part. Yeah, what is the algorithm behind that? the connection part, so how can that be composed, or how is a, a composed component uh, composed and connected out of smaller ones, communication issues, uh, configuration issues, 
and coordination issues. So configuration actually is often um, much more complex than computation. Yeah? So if you look at public interfaces of many of the classes, even in, in, in ROS nodes, there are maybe only three methods that you actually use when the, the node is uh, operational, but there may be maybe 10 or 20 methods just to configure the node. Yeah? So the interface complexity is much higher for someone who needs to actually configure the node than for someone who is just using it. And <coughs> this can help, especially if the development groups for robotic projects might grow larger, that uh, you separate this so that only someone who is actually responsible for setting up this component and configuring it in the right way, yeah, so uh, they need to know this precisely and for the others, the complexity of using that uh, device, for example, is much uh, simpler. Uh, if you're just interested in getting uh, laser scans, then basically one method should be enough to, uh, to do it. And uh, there's something coordination. This is actually a problem we have not yet really solved, but um, a lot of interfaces, uh, if you do object-oriented programming, have implicit constraints on in which order you can use the methods. And this is often not documented at all, or only implicitly documented. So that you need to initialize a component before actually getting a scan. Yeah? <coughs> and uh, things like that. So we are looking into uh, state machine, or using state machine concepts for describing these kind of things. So as the time is already uh, quite um, um, Progress. I'm skipping a little bit other things we worry about like object-oriented interface design or using uh, abstraction for various kind of things like abstracting kinematics and motion. Uh, these are older examples we have already done in uh, Miro and sorry, this is another illustration of how the abstraction of a soccer goal can see get implemented. So I actually, I like this one. Yeah? So how do you play soccer in this uh, environment? Or this one. So. OK. Um, so there's actually a lot of things that we uh, have done. As I mentioned, beyond Ross a little bit, um, we have been looking, for example, in the scalability issues. Yeah? So is it possible to scale a ROS application uh, if you, for example, if more subscribers come into a ROS topic and stuff like that, how does it develop? And <clears throat> what is interesting is this table. We use basically two kinds of message sizes, uh, 100 kilobyte and uh, two megabytes. So I think this is uh, point cloud data, this is uh, laser scan or something like that. And different frequencies to this uh, <coughs> with, uh, for publishing uh, these yeah? and compared, for example, Zero and Q and ROS. And <coughs> you see that at some point uh, you can get enormous latencies. Yeah? Here over 140, no, here over 94 seconds in the maximum. Yeah? So this is not what you would expect if it's normally maybe in the, in the area of 10 milliseconds. Yeah. So um, you can hit uh, a boundary very quickly, very easily, and there are more anecdotes to that. Uh, when I was at Willow Garage, we had a discussion with um, Ross people about this and uh, some of the summer interns, uh, which was uh, quite interesting. Okay, so system deployment. Once we have required all the, or developed all the required uh, functionalities, we need to package them together in a system. Yeah? Because um, if I see how even at, at competitions, how some of these robots are interfaced and operated, so people type a terminal, uh, all kinds of long sequences of commands to get uh, all kinds of processes started and operational, uh, I think rescue might be an exception here because you from the beginning had a much stronger focus on these operator interfaces, but in other leagues this is uh, really uh, the case. 
this is not what you can uh, <coughs> turn into a product. Yeah? <coughs> the second thing is that you need to finally determine the runtime architecture. Yeah? So you have the real hardware available, you know what is actually running, and now you can go about and you know, uh, define and also optimize the runtime uh, architecture and launch the system and do system level testing. Yeah? <coughs> so that basically means now we have completed more or less the system from a software architecture point of uh, view. So what comes, uh, oh sorry, um, with this, what comes with this is that you have to define the runtime architecture and the runtime architecture yeah, may uh, involve that things that you might have run on the same computer are now run on different computers. That means only at that point it is really important to think about middleware. And we think that you should not develop a robot architecture with a particular middleware or a kind of communication <coughs> structure in mind. Yeah? You should develop the software such that every connection between two software components can either be a direct method call or can involve, for example, a caller, uh, call or something like that. Yeah? <coughs> and this is actually what comes in here because it would go between components and the object-oriented <coughs> layers. And in fact, I believe that uh, most of this stuff can be almost automated yeah, so that you don't need to do a lot of manual programming but generate this code automatically once you have specified the runtime architecture. So, um, the close to last slide, uh, I think, um, is uh, this one I want to focus because benchmarking is uh, something that is, uh, you know, debated in the scientific community for, at least in Europe, for 10, 15 years now. But at least in Europe, we haven't really made so much progress on it. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, uh, I think the understanding of what it takes to do benchmarking is increasing, but uh, the, in the reality out there, we still don't see it, for example, as a regular procedure that someone uh, publishing yet another paper about SLAM is actually using some standard test to compare the results, yeah? at least as far as I know. So I think there are different kinds of benchmarking that we need to do. <coughs> One is stress test the components of the complete system. Yeah? So this would be tests, let's say, that give you a normal or even a high or a low workload within the limits of the specification. So the system is operating within the limits. Yeah? For safety and security testing, however, you also have to go beyond these limits and check what is happening. Yeah? To give you an idea, the, the KUKA lightweight arm, for example, if you read the specification, it's specified for lifting seven and a half kilograms. Yeah? I know that it's laid out to actually lift 15 kilograms. So you have a margin of 100% of the spec as security provided by the manufacturer. Yeah? <laughs> so you're not supposed to regularly lift 10 <coughs> kilograms, but if you try it once or so, it should nothing should really happen. If you go beyond the 15 kilograms, you might really have to order another lightweight arm. Yeah? So if you have $100,000, in the box, uh, you can of course do that, but uh, yeah. But this is actually what happens if things break, for example, if a connection breaks. Yeah. I have a PhD student in my group who worked in, a, uh, in the roster project before and he, <coughs> for example, performed some tests operating a small robot pulling randomly uh, some wires out of the system and then seeing what happens. What is the system doing if that happens? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and I think we have to do such uh, things. Then perform reliability and durability uh, tests. So have your system uh, you know, in higher temperature than normal, 45 degrees outside, uh, uh, sunshine, have it operating for 10 hours continuously to see uh, uh, whether it can take it. <coughs> 
and stuff like that. Yeah? And how long does it uh, do that before it breaks? Yeah? I don't know who of you has been at Willow Mirage, but uh, they, for example, when they built their arms for the PR2, they have a testing uh, room where every arm is installed and they do, I think, something like 10,000 movements with every arm before it even gets mounted onto the system. Yeah? <clears throat> and they do that because they know that there is something like an earlier failure, uh, early failure uh, syndrome. Yeah? Sometimes uh, things simply break even shortly after usage and they want to avoid that they deliver a lot of robots where that happens because it's expensive to send um, a maintenance engineer there or have the <laughs> robot ship back. Yeah? So they rather do these 10,000 movements in the lab, then they know, okay, this one is good, and if it breaks on the process, they throw it away or repair it or whatever, yeah? and test again. <coughs> and last but not least, gather actual performance data. There we would like to compute statistics on whatever, best, worst, and average cases. So I want to know as a potential customer, what can this do? Yeah, so uh, to take uh, Adam's example of this uh, building, these wood, wooden things around uh, pillars and stuff like that, yeah, you would want to know, okay, how many such 4x4s uh, uh, four can the robot carry into this site, let's say over a distance of 20 meters uh, per hour or something like that. Yeah. <coughs> so then, I think uh, for, maybe not for rescue robots, but for if you are going to see uh, service uh, robots in the market, in the real market, uh, the development prototype will not what will be produced. Yeah? So uh, there's another phase to make a real marketable product out of that. And that means that you are throwing out everything that is helpful and needed for development, so you don't need all the tools anymore. You shrink the hardware, do whatever is possible, and stuff like that. So actually, we visited um, Evolution Robotics in Pasadena, who built this small um, uh, floor cleaning robot, the Mint system. And um, we presented uh, uh, our work and stuff like that. And they said, OK, this is actually the phase where more than 90% of their development uh, took place for them, yeah, for a consumer product. So basically because all the, the functionality, the software architecture, the intelligence, and, and even the, the robot design, they could do basically in three days. Yeah? But it took them nine months or, or even longer to put everything into such small hardware that they can uh, build it at cost, which allows them to sell it at a reasonable price and still make profit. Yeah? <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> so things for larger robots, of course, would, for example, include that we need to instrument robots for maintenance. Yeah? Assume you deliver your robot half a year to another lab. And then they call and say, OK, there's a problem here. Yeah? And some, you go over there and want to repair the robot. One of the first things you need to know is, uh, how has the robot been used? What have they done with it? Yeah? This is the standard thing that is, for example, nowadays the case if you go to car maintenance. Yeah? You go to the uh, car shop or the car dealer, and the first thing is they connect to the computer and then they see everything, everything. Yeah? The one lamp the left, turn light on the right, whatever. They, they see every error that happened in the last year and they know exactly what to do. Yeah? And uh, I think uh, no one in robotics probably has really thought about what are the, the, the things that we would want to know after coming big, after half a year of operation. Yeah. <coughs> so, and last but not least, maintenance. I think I don't want to say much about that because this is something that uh, no one of us has much experience. Yeah. So, we are now probably loaded with this project bricks. There's a nice picture of that. Uh, also kind of architecture if you want. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you for giving us uh, such a
big picture, letting us uh, get out of our little focus areas to see what the um, what else needs to be done to make these things work. Are there any questions? Okay, I fully agree with uh, most of your findings and responses. I have uh, a lot of experience in the automotive industry. What I'm totally missing here, and I think it's really crucial, is uh, the component model. Uh, I think you need to link up with the uh, reusable building blocks for software, for hardware, and robotics. Yeah. But uh, to achieve uh, a global market for that, you need uh, part of the component model, which is the standard. And uh, what I'm missing here is the, the requirements for a standard for components. So the automotive industry made it really forward to the side. So they, they have a lot of effort put in there to standardize components and how they interact, how they are built. So I, I agree completely with you. I would be a little bit more cautious with the word standard maybe, because I'm not so sure whether a standard like an ISO standard or IEEE standard or whatever uh, would actually be needed. There's a lot of debate about that. On one hand side, there's a community that is actively working on standards. Yeah? And I think what is a little bit uh, strange for me at least is that uh, large parts of the community in robotics seem to completely neglect what is going on there. Yeah? It's an activity that is highly promoted in Asia mainly, in Korea and in Japan. And uh, these, but um, I don't really know many European roboticists that uh, currently seem to worry uh, about that. Uh, that story might be different for some companies. I could imagine ABP and KUKA and, and these folks have uh, some involvement there, but uh, it does not really reflect on the academic community. That's uh, my impression. But I agree. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, in order for that to be successful, um, there needs to be uh, like a component model that gets widely accepted. Yeah? Even a standard might not do it. If the standard gets not accepted, then it's useless. Yeah? Um, and, and I think there have been examples of such uh, standards uh, before, yeah? which uh, have not seen the necessary uh, acceptance. So what I uh, worry more about is, you know, how s should uh, such a component model really look like? What are the, uh, the interface and the structural and behavioral parts of it and stuff like that? And that's exactly what we are actually still working on in BRICS. I make no promises anymore whether we will be able to, to finish that, but we are working, for example, uh, jointly with uh, other uh, projects uh, on that. So this is uh, actually an effort to coordinate between several European projects at least, like uh, also, uh, what is it called? Uh, and there's a French project, Proteus, and uh, uh, what is the other project, Hammond is involved? Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, in any case, uh, so there, there is actually some effort going on before me. There's a, a workshop in the <coughs> 1st of October in Paris uh, where we will exactly discuss this topic. So if you compare your component model versus the officer component model, is there uh, similarities? Automotive and robotics should be very close. I cannot... Uh, I, uh, I would have to have a closer look. I cannot say uh, uh, from the top of my head. Um, I know that we have had people in the project who had been looking at all these. So AADL, uh, Autosar, uh, all the, the component models that float around in robotics themselves, and so on. Uh, but to what extent uh, the similarities are there, I cannot say so easily. Yeah. Okay, very, very quick. Robotics is really multidisciplinary. Yeah. And we want every type of people to be really in the world of robotics. But when you look at these software interfaces, they are not used for them. Very, very complex and very important. Uh, uh, are you thinking of any kind of user friendly so that you can allow everyone to do it? Yes. Uh, I agree, and it's for me it's a constant fight, even with my own PhD students and my students, to ensure that uh, interfaces will become friendly. Uh, so, I mean, if you look at this 5C, for example, uh, that is an attempt, for example, to make it easier for users. 
So imagine you have a development group of 20 people uh, working on a larger uh, uh, service important project. So if you are the one who is responsible, for example, for mapping and stuff like that, you don't probably want to know about all the details of the laser scan and stuff like that. All you're interested in is, hey, I want to get laser scan, I want to get death map, and stuff like that. But how to set up all these devices and interface to them should be none of your concerns. Yeah? So by separating these concerns, we are trying to go a step in that uh, direction. We are also working on guidelines for interface design and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. But at the end, you know, all you can do is really recommendations and stuff like that. And uh, um, it depends on the people actually accepting these and, and living these in their daily work. Otherwise. Okay. Yeah. You always hold a great, uh, clear mirror up to us so we can evaluate ourselves as humans and as researchers and our tendencies. Uh, so let me just say uh, one comment, one question. Um, about the interfaces. You mentioned that uh, mesh release is more focused on their interfaces maybe than other of these. And I would say that that might be a direct consequence of having less comfortable seating in our arena. <laughs> Your early pictures of your lab and uh, you know, development area uh, oh. relative to our rather uncomfortable step fields and you know for debugging oh, well, uh, forces into that. So, uh, uh, do you think I should maybe replace it? It's looking, it's looking plush. Yeah. Okay, but my question is: uh, you mentioned that Amer uh, Americans don't even read European uh, papers, and I would, I would prefer I agree. So there's a big ocean between us. What I'm wondering is. Um, what is your, the European visibility of, uh, of popular, I would say, US architectures like 40 RCS? Like 40 RCS is a hierarchical architecture actually invented by my recently the past mentor, Mitch Alvis. Pretty much adopted by the US military for autonomous vehicles. I mean, almost exclusively. Uh, I have. I have seen all these architectures, but I think uh, the, the problem is uh, really who you are talking to. Yeah? So um, if you talk to the PIs of a major European project, you know, that is starting and going into this endeavor, you are probably talking to people who have heard about these and maybe even know more or less about these architectures. Yeah? So that is the next level. Uh, then you have PhD students that get employed into the actual work. Depending on how experienced they already are, they have either uh, no idea about it, no background on this. Yeah. So it depends already on how you guide and instruct them, what literature they see. But uh, usually you don't have the time you know, to set them one year just reading papers to get themselves a good overview of that and then to a learned decision about we go for this or that. Yeah? So it's a little bit this conflict in which uh, you are that, that people, uh, to some extent, it's not very structured. I mean, there's no point where I could address someone to say, OK, this is an authoritative presentation of what the community knows about architecture. Yeah? So uh, I think there's, it would be completely stupid to claim that there's one single architecture that works for every application. It's obviously not the case. But having a uh, notion about, so, okay, this architecture you know, works successfully in this and this application. If, if you have something like this, it might be a candidate for a good architecture, but the question is how can you generalize and translate to a different situation, a different problem. <coughs> I think, um, Many architectures are not uh, sufficiently well documented. Um, it is maybe true that uh, uh, there would still be uh, or should still be more attention to looking into these kind of things, but why in detail uh, people are not looking into this, uh, I would have, have a second look myself. Look the right now. Yeah. No? If there's a true benchmarking going on and success, Yes. Makes people want to look, look deeper 
and how. Yeah, you definitely. Know. I think uh, that's why we, uh, I, I uh, wanted to offer this. Uh, if there's interest here in the community, uh, I could give, uh, or we could just have this over a beer in the lobby if you want. So I could give you an overview of uh, a new EU project which is going to start in January. We are going to have the negotiations um, next week, um, which will focus on RoboCup at home and at work. It also uh, has to promote competitions in Europe, naturally, uh, and benchmarking um, <coughs> in this area. So we will uh, uh, insert or inject a huge drive to make things more benchmarkable. Yeah, and um, uh, I think this is very important. Right now, some of the RoboCup uh, competitions are very good for benchmarking. I think you have set really standards. You got my ideal uh, in that uh, case because uh, in soccer, I don't uh, see that yet. And in at home, if I look at home, for example, there are tests which are very objective. Yeah, you have objective criteria for evaluating performance, the number of people recognized, or the number of objects fetched, or number of <coughs> goals reached, and stuff like that. That's all accessible objectively, and no debate about it. And there are other tests in there which are very uh, subjective evaluation, yeah? like the, the open challenge and, and stuff like that. And uh, the question is whether we can find criteria either to reduce it from subjective, evaluation methods, which are always biased. Yeah? How do you compare someone who is better in uh, speech communication rather than object manipulation? Yeah? How do you trade this off each other? Everyone has a personal preference, which one might be more important than the other. And <clears throat> there's no real comparison. And, uh, I think uh, this will help us a little bit to make progress on that. So the, the difficulty, or I think the challenge is that uh, usually if you look into particular functionalities and subsystems, uh, you have uh, either already um, established benchmarks there, yeah, like whatever for object recognition or uh, even speech recognition, stuff like that, they exist, uh, certain benchmarks. <coughs> but um, what is missing is a connection between evaluating subsystems and evaluating the overall system. Yeah? And what we would like to have, or what Robocop does, is at the end we evaluate the complete system, but we cannot tell really why did this team win over the other team. <clears throat> Was it the better object perception, or the better soccer strategy, or the better navigation, or did they simply have the better hardware, the most faster and more powerful, or so on? Yeah? Well, we have preliminaries <coughs> Each of those tested separately. Yeah. If you had an aggregate score, you could see who the best of yeah. those things. And you could be simply so that's what we're following. Yeah. But I like very much your approach, you know, that uh, what, what I saw in your in talks of others is that you identify certain capabilities that your rescue robots need to have. <laughs> and then you define tests where you can assess the performance of the robots in performing these. And uh, this is not yet really used, for example, in RoboCup at home. And I think this is where we will start uh, pushing the community <coughs> to do such tests. So uh, when I uh, saw the first uh, news about uh, the little garage here to opening the door handle, opening the door, yeah? uh, I think two years ago or so, <coughs> I went around in my own house and I counted how many different door handles and door knobs and different types of doors and door mechanisms and how many doors and windows and drawers I have in my home. Yeah, I have the statistics uh, somewhere if you're interested. I didn't even know that my home has six doors to the outside, which <laughs> I was surprised myself. Yeah, but, uh, it actually does, and it has, a, an, uh, it has something like 120 different doors yeah, and uh, 10 or 12 different mechanisms. And I think we should uh, really have, maybe as preliminaries or as tests, a 
at RoboCup at home, such things, <coughs> where you can go through a row and there are all these different mechanisms and uh, how many of those can you can you uh, put ten out there? Yeah? Uh, We've got nine of them. Window switches, uh, operating the shades, uh, and mm. stuff like that. It just has a phase of the competition. <coughs> a challenge. It also helps you bring in new teams who are only good at one. Yes. But they're very, very good at it. Yeah. And they got the focus and then the separate. Sorry. <laughs> we'll talk again. Yes, so thank you once again, Gerhard, for And uh, actually, you have some other things that you want to share with people, I guess, at some point later on. Okay, in, so... In the lobby over here yeah, one was, one was this Rockin project. If uh, Is anyone risk, interested in learning more about this? One? Okay. The project is called Rockin. <laughs> Detroit's adventure. Uh, this is this EU project which focuses on at home and at work and the competitions in Europe. Oh, this is what it's called? Yes, okay. Rocket. That's an acronym for it. And the other one is on a Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, a new uh, kind of association will be founded in Brussels, which is intended to unite the two big European networks in robotics, Europe and Euron, eventually. And if someone wants to know more about this, then he's also happy to ask. So, how many would that be who are interested in Eurobotics? Okay, so both are groups are small enough, so let's meet. Uh, what, what would be the right so time? Maybe tomorrow between the end of the practical sessions and dinner might be a nice, nice, a nice time. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have yet one of these Turkish mockers. I have no idea when they do it, but maybe we can have one at six in the <laughs> lobby and meet there. Is that okay? Yeah?